Good morning. Why don't you uh, bow with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Abba, Lord, speak your words through my mouth to their hearts. Let healing come today to those who are in pain and need relief. Let your Holy Spirit have its way with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, uh, my name's Brian Mackert, and uh, as Pastor Mike uh, informed you, I, I grew up in a polygamous Mormon family. Uh, my father had four wives and 31 children. I'm his 28th child. And my family history in the Mormon church goes back to the days of Joseph Smith back in Independence, Missouri. I'm a seventh generation Mormon. And uh, growing up in a large polygamous Mormon family is a very dysfunctional environment. Um, I get asked a lot of, a lot of questions when I, I share with people my family and my background. One of the common questions that are a, is asked is, well, if your dad has four wives, is there like a a rotating schedule on which wife he spends the night with. And I said, yeah, he, he puts his boots in front of the doors uh, of, of, the, of his wives. When he wants to spend the night with wife number three, he puts his boots in front of her door. And if she takes his boots inside, he knows he's welcome to spend the night there. And uh, so th th I get all kinds of crazy questions about what life is growing up like growing up in uh, a polygamous Mormon family. One of the common questions I get is, don't you feel like a number? And I do. I did feel like a number. I was the youngest of my mother's seven children and uh, fourth to last in my father's 31 children. And so by the time I came along, my dad didn't have time for me. I, I learned about being a man by watching my older brothers who were still trying to figure it out themselves. In fact, when I was born, my father uh, would put false names on our birth certificates to try and hide his identity as a polygamous Mormon so that he wouldn't get in trouble with the law. And so with my mother's children, he had chosen the last name of Chapman because that was his mother's maiden name. And when I was born, my mother wasn't sure if my father had finally settled on my first name being Brian. But she knew that my last name was going to be Chapman. And she started the downstroke of the letter B, and she stopped. And she said, well, I better, I better check with my husband before I finish filling this out. And she went ahead and wrote in Chapman as the last name. Well, the hospital waited for three days, and when they hadn't heard back from my mother... They went ahead and filed my birth certificate, and for five years, my legal name was one Chapman. <laughs> so, yes, I, I do know what it feels like to be a number. Um, but growing up uh, in, a, in a polygamous Mormon family is a very dysfunctional environment, uh, as I mentioned earlier. You're going to find the same... Uh, codependency and dysfunction in a polygamous Mormon home as you're going to find in an alcoholic home or an, a, a drug addiction home. And uh, there was also, uh, you know, pastor said that I, I, I shouldn't hold back like I did in the first service. Uh, in the first service, we had too many young ears in the room, and so I'm just going to let it fly today uh, in this service. In our home, uh, when I was a young boy, uh, there was a lot of physical abuse. Uh, I, I was beaten uh, with wire coat hangers to the point where I couldn't sit down for two weeks uh, over the smallest of infractions. One time it was because I would not confess to a crime that I did not commit. And I was beaten until I couldn't sit down for two weeks. Um, but the gravest of the abuses that took place in my home I didn't know until I was 12 years old when my mother left my father <clears throat> and she sat me down to explain that she was leaving dad and asked me if I would leave with her 
And when I asked her why she was leaving dad, she said the words that I will never forget. She said, Brian, your father has been sexually abusing your sisters. And suddenly, all the little signs that I had seen and ignored and hoped that that was just Satan trying to mess with my mind and turn my heart in anger towards my father. I hoped that they weren't real, that it was just imagined. Suddenly all those little signs that I ignored became very real. The way my father's hand would graze across my sisters as they would walk by and things like that suddenly had a whole new meaning. For me, this was very devastating because um, my father had raised me with a coat of armor where women to, were to be revered, respected, and protected because they bring life into this world. And it didn't matter what a woman's moral condition might be. If I found a prostitute being beaten in an alleyway by her pimp, I should be willing to lay down my life in defense of her simply because she's a woman. And as a young man, I found out that the person my sisters needed protection from the most was the person who taught me this code of honor. And I became very angry towards my father. I hated my father. I loved my father. And I hated the fact that I loved my father. And that rage and that anger began to boil over to the point where I wanted to kill my father. And I began plotting his murder. And now when I, when I left as a teenager, I had gotten tired of this constant works theology and, and, and trying to be worthy enough and according to the religion that I was raised with, if I couldn't meet a certain standard, I was just going to go to hell. And because I had left, I was definitely going to go to hell. And so I decided, well, if I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to earn it. So <clears throat> I started drinking like a fish. I started chasing everything that wore a skirt. And I got addicted to crystal meth. And I was living as fast and as hard as I could. And I didn't want to slow down. I didn't want to stop. Because slowing down and stopping meant that I would feel something. And I didn't want to feel. So, there I was, a young man. My life is just spinning out of control. And somebody suggested that I join the military to... Uh, get control of my life. So I joined the Navy. And my time in the Navy was a blur of drugs, alcohol, and women. And uh, fortunately, praise God, I got caught on a urinalysis test for abusing drugs and I was forced into substance abuse counseling. And in the course of substance abuse counseling, it was revealed that I was planning my father's murder. And so they sent me to a psychiatrist to deal with my homicidal thoughts and feelings towards my father. And that began to change the trajectory of my life. If it had not been for that drug test, I probably would have continued to abuse crystal meth and would have OD'd when the formula for the purification and its processing was refined to where it's 95% pure. Back when I was addicted, it was only 75% pure. Now it's so addictive, one use is all it takes and you're addicted. One use of crystal meth is all it takes, 
and you just threw your life away. And I praise God that he saved me from that fate. I praise God for that urinalysis that I failed. And I praise God for the counselor that came into my life and taught me that the, the past does not dictate your future. That the future can be whatever you want to make it. And just because my father was a pedophile didn't mean that I was going to be a pedophile too. Well, <clears throat> when I left the counselor's office, he had given me permission to take responsibility for my life and that as I walked through those doors, I could, I could make my life anything that I wanted it to be. And so I chose to walk through those doors and start a new way of life. And so I repented of my ways and I left the military and I, or I left the Navy and I joined the Marine Corps. And uh, when I joined the Marine Corps, I said, I'm done with drugs, clean living from here on out. And I lived my life in the Marine Corps, striving to be the best Marine that I could be. And I ended up stationed in Okinawa, Japan. <clears throat> And while I was uh, stationed there, I started going to a, a Christian church because my wife, my ex-wife and I, we wanted to be able to be united in what we taught our child about God. And she was raised in a Baptist home and I was raised in a Mormon home. And she said, well, what do Mormons believe? So I sat down and I explained the whole law of eternal progression and the pre-existence theologies of Mormonism because Mormons believe that they can become gods one day, that they can progress to godhood. And that's the central theme of Mormonism and it's the main thing that separates Mormons and Christians. Christianity teaches that there's only one God in all of existence. There are no other gods. Mormonism teaches that he's just one of many gods and that you too can become a god. And after I got done explaining the law of eternal progression and the pre-existence theology of Mormonism, she said, that's okay, I've heard enough, let me sleep on it. And in the morning she came down and said, there's no way in the world I can become a Mormon. And I, first of all, I was relieved. I'd, I'd lost my faith in Mormonism and uh, didn't want to have to go back to it. Uh, but I was curious, well, why not? Why don't you want to become a Mormon? And she pulled out Isaiah 43.10 where God says that there were no gods formed before him and there'll be none formed after him either. And that one verse had the power to destroy everything I was working for as a Mormon. All of, all of Mormon theology came crashing down for me at that moment. And so I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a, a good Christian. I'm going I'm to try Christianity out. And so I started singing in the choir, playing in a bluegrass gospel group. I started uh, going on evangelistic crusades. I was teaching Sunday school classes. I was working in the nursery. Every time the doors of the church were open, I was there because I had taken the works theology of Mormonism and I cloaked it in Christianity. I was still trying to earn my salvation. And in that constant struggle that works produces I could never be good enough in fact it didn't matter how many pledges that I made with my addictive personality to no longer participate in pornography I always failed because I was a, I was a porn addict too not just a meth addict I was a porn addict too and so I was really struggling with pornography and, and I set aside my, my, my drive to work as my prayer time. And I was getting really frustrated in my Christian life. And the pastor was preaching a new sermon series on the new creation that comes to those who are in Christ. And as the pastor was preaching about that, I'd look in the mirror and I saw the same ugly person I'd always been. Nothing had changed about Brian. The only thing that changed about Brian was Brian got good at playing church. 
Brian got good at hiding his sin. Brian got good at doing enough good works that people in the church would look at Brian and say, there's a good man. But they didn't see the darkness in my own heart. But when I looked in the mirror, I saw myself the way God saw me in my sin. And God saw the darkness of my heart, and I saw the darkness of my heart. So I'm driving on my way to work, and I'm getting into an argument with God. By the way, some of the best conversations you'll ever have with God are arguments. And it's okay. He can handle your anger. Trust me. So I'm getting in this argument with God, and I'm like, God, why can't you fix my life? And the Holy Spirit said, Brian, what's wrong? I said, my life's a mess. You said you would make a new creation out of those who come to faith in you, and I find no evidence for that in my life. And the Holy Spirit said, well, who died for your sins? I said, well, you did. He goes, okay. So what's missing then? What haven't you done? Immediately, Romans 10, 9 through 11 came to my mind where it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. And I confessed to God that I'd never made this profession of faith. And the Holy Spirit says, and you wonder why sin still rules in your life, Brian? I can't fix what you haven't given me. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. You mean to say that just because I haven't said that sinner's prayer, I've been trying to get other people to say that you can't fix my life? And God said, no, you don't understand, son. I can't fix what you haven't given me. And I knew in that moment that what God wanted wasn't a sinner's prayer. What God wanted was my life. He couldn't fix my life because I hadn't given him my life. Now, it was 4.30 in the morning when I was having this conversation with God and it was pouring down rain as I was on my way to go run with my Marines and I could no longer see the road because of the rain combined with my tears. And I pulled my car off to the side of the road. And me and God in the front seat of my car I prayed and received Christ and God began changing my heart and changing my life and the first thing that God wanted to change about my life was my inability to forgive my father and me and God fought over that one for a long time for about six months we fought over it and scripture kept jumping off of the page at me Forgive as you've been forgiven, for as you forgive, you shall be forgiven. I'm not going to forgive him. What are you crazy? There's no how can you ask me to forgive that vile man? Don't you understand what he's done, God? That's what my conversation was like with God. And one day I shouted out out loud. He's not worthy of my forgiveness. And God, ever so gently, said, neither were you. And I knew that I had to forgive my father. So I called up my dad and we talked. We hadn't spoken in about 12 years. And I forgave him. And what shocked me the most, I thought that forgiving my father would somehow change my father's heart. God's desire for me to forgive my father had absolutely nothing to do with my father's need for my forgiveness or what God wanted to do in my father's life. Me forgiving my father, God wanted me to forgive my father so that I would let go of the bitterness and the anger. So that God could come in and heal my heart. See, because as long as you're clinging to that anger and that bitterness, God can't come in and heal it. As long as you've got your fist clenched around that thing, God can't get to it. You've got to let go of it. 
so that he can heal it. And one of the reasons why we suffer in our relationships is because of our unwillingness to obey God when he says, forgive as you've been forgiven. And the judgment does not belong to you. It belongs to God. The interesting part is is that God often has to teach you the same lesson repeatedly. Right? So as I'm dealing with my addictive nature and my personalities, uh, I spent 23 years away from home. While I was gone, God got me involved in the prison ministry, taught me that my spiritual gift was evangelism, my spiritual gift was preaching and teaching, and that I was being called to the ministry, and I accepted the call to the ministry, and God revealed to me that he wanted me to return to the people I grew up with and share the gospel with them, the people who abused me as a child. Now, as a child, the abuse wasn't just from my parents, it was from my siblings as well. When I came home, my brother Shem, who was 12 years older than me, sat down with me and we shared a beer together. And he said, Brian, my earliest memory of you as a child is you curled up in the fetal position with your knees tucked into your chest and your face buried into your knees, screaming, leave me alone. And if we'd had souls, we would have left you alone. But we didn't. We thought it was funny to make you cry. I was tortured and tormented by my siblings. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was the deep emotional wound that drove my addictions. That's why I was self-medicating, was because of the abandonment and rejection, not of my parents, but by my siblings. The people who were supposed to love me and care about me the most were my enemies in my home. And suddenly the dam broke loose and all the memories flooded back. I had that stuff nice and neatly compartmentalized in alphabetical order, under lock and key. There's no way that monster was getting out again. And here my brother Shem, with a stick of dynamite, blew the door open and I had to deal with that ugly monster again I had to go through the grief process I went through the anger the hate how could you treat me that way I was just a little boy and then God had to bring me back to forgiveness. You want healing in your life, you want healing in your relationships, try obeying God when he says to forgive. Because you aren't going to find that healing and you aren't going to find that peace that you're looking for until you do. Open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. I'll wait till you get there because this is important. Starting in verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
What's Christ's yoke in this verse? What was Christ's mission on this earth? Christ's yoke and Christ's mission on this earth was to bring forgiveness of our sins, to bring peace between us and God. Christ's yoke is forgiveness. So now that we understand what the yoke is, let's look at the verse again. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. What's your burden? Has someone hurt you? Has someone wronged you? What's your burden? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, take my forgiveness upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find what? You'll find rest for your souls. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. My friends, saints, I'm here to tell you that forgiveness is much easier to carry than the burden you're carrying right now. How long have you been holding this grudge? How long have you been holding this bitterness? How long have you been carrying that baggage? How well is that working for you? Think maybe it's time to try it God's way? Trust me. You'll be so glad you did. Because it's not about them. It's about you. God loves you. He died for you. He wants to make you whole. And in order to do that, you have to give him all of yourself, your life and your bitterness and your anger and your grudges and your wounds. You have to give it all to him. Is he Lord of your life or not? Because if he's Lord, you'll give it to him. And he commands you to forgive as you've been forgiven. We want healing in our lives. We want healing in our relationships. We want healing in our marriages. We want healing in our communities. We want healing with the racial divide that we see in our country today. What happened to forgiveness? What happened to loving your neighbor as you love yourself? You know, I think right now is a good time to close. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, oh Lord, the burdens that we carry, Oh, the pain of it. Lord, you know each and every burden in this room. You know how long they've been carrying it. You know how deep that wound is. And you are the great physician. And you can come in with your gentleness and your love and your grace. And you can heal those wounds. But Lord, We acknowledge that you can't do that unless we let go of it and we allow you in. We allow you to come in and heal us from the inside out. Oh, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not been able to let go of some trauma in their life where they've been abused or neglected or hurt or wounded, that you would bring healing to their hearts today, that you would give them the courage to be able to let go of the past and be obedient to you and forgive as they've been forgiven.
Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a moment. This is a moment of privacy. And let's respect the privacy of those around us. If you recognize in your life that you need prayer about some level of unforgiveness that you have in your heart, I'd like to pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just raise your hand and let me know that you need prayer. That there's forgiveness that you need to give. I see that hand. I see those hands. Praise God. Lord God, you know these hurts. You know, know these pains. You know these sufferings that people have today. Oh Lord, let them truly forgive. Let them take upon themselves the weight of that burden, the cost of it, and never hold the offender accountable again. That's what you did for us in Christ Jesus. You took upon our sin. You took upon the cost of it. Lord, let healing come to these lives where abuses have been. Let them live in joy and peace. Let them have rest for their souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.